Vi går så småt i gang igen. And you have everything, water and everything. Det, der nu er succeskriteriet, det er, at vi får et inspirationsoplæg af Sir Harry Burns, som vil fortælle os om et emne, som har relevans i hele verden, nemlig emnet ulighed i sundhedsvæsenet. Oplægget vil være på engelsk. Har alle sammen styr på hjælpemidlerne desangående? Ja, det finder vi ud af. Er der nogen af jer, der kan høre det, jeg siger, vi oversat til engelsk? Så virker det. Okay. Thank you very much. So Harry Burns, thank you very much for participating in our general assessment. We are very pleased to get a view from you about how you see about the, the challenges we are facing in the healthcare and you have a long, long history and good experience to tell us about that. We are very pleased that you in a very tight schedule managed to participate here. Thank you very much. The word is yours. Thank you very much. Well, thank you very much for the opportunity to come to Denmark. I always feel very comfortable in Denmark. I firmly believe that we Scots are more Viking than Anglo-Saxon. And if next year we uh, become independent, or later this year we become independent from England, I fully intend to, to dig a trench along the border and have Scotland towed to somewhere off North Denmark, okay? I'll have a difficulty with that because some of my friends want it to be towed to somewhere off South Spain, but I think we will win. Okay. So, it's nice to be in Denmark. I must say, when I heard this was going to be in Aalborg, I was a bit thoughtful about coming to Aalborg because <laughs> some years ago, the local team put my team out the Champions League. I say the local team did it. We actually missed a penalty and scored an own goal. But, <laughs> but I see we're both likely to be back. In fact, Celtic have already qualified for the Champions League this year, and Alborg may do so too, so we may get our revenge this year. So what causes us to be well? My, um, my history is of being a surgeon, and for the first 15 years of my career, I tried to cure disease, and then I thought that was the wrong way to go about things, and then I tried for many years to try and prevent disease. But it's become very clear to me that the best way to make people well is to create health. The positive actions you can take that can create wellness in a population rather than the negative ones that stop people doing things that do them damage. And the reason we don't tend to do it is because health is created by a complex system. Society is a complex system. And every time we want to change a complex system, we always make the mistake of thinking there's one thing that you can do to change it. You pull a lever and the whole system changes. The thing about complex systems is that they are very self-organizing. You change one thing and the system organizes itself to make sure that nothing really has happened. So if you want to change a complex system, you have to first of all destabilize it. You have to make it clear that whatever happens, there's going to be a new system. And then you apply simple rules, and the hardest thing for politicians is allow the outcomes to emerge. People like to know in advance what the outcomes are going to be so they can set targets and so on. That's not how complex systems work. You have to stand back and see the outcomes emerge, and if you've set the right order generating rules, you will get something close to the outcomes you desire. But the first thing to say is destabilize the system, and that doesn't mean have a revolution, okay? Um, and my Danish friends tell me that if ever the Danes decided to have a revolution, you'd all get together, it would start to rain, and you'd say, ha, and we'd go home. Okay, And that's the same in Scotland. If we decided to have a revolution, we'd all meet in the big square, we'd recognize people we haven't seen for ages, and we'd just go off and have a beer with them. Okay, So revolution is not the way we do this. We destabilize the system by making it clear that things have to change. 
So I have decided, and over the past few years, I have been destabilizing our system through science, making it plain through hard science that the way we organize our society does not give the best hope for health to emerge. This is simple order generating rules. Everyone's seen these birds swooping and flying and so on. The simple order generating rule that makes birds behave in that beautiful fashion as thousands of them feed at night is, is not, you know, there's no chief executive bird. There's no strategic plan for flying that way. The simple rule is fly close to the bird in front of you. And this complex, beautiful pattern emerges. So the simple rules are important. So we build the will for change. We create a forum by which ideas emerge that will give us the aims that become the simple rules. And then critically, we agree a method for delivering that change. And it's not done by strategic planning. We'll go through that one by one. So the science of Scotland's health. For years, people have believed this about the Scots. First of all, we're unhealthy. Secondly, we're unhealthy because we smoke too much, we eat too much fatty food, we drink too much, and if only we would grow up and do the right thing, we'd all be healthy. Well, the fact is, only one of those statements is true, all right? We're not an unhealthy country. This graph shows trends in life expectancy in 16 Western European countries for the past 160 years. The earliest we've got life expectancy for Scotland is 1851. You can see that for most of that time, Scottish life expectancy has been about the European average. This is the Second World War, the First World War, various bits of Austro-Hungarian, Franco-Prussian nastiness. Only in the past few decades have we slipped behind the rest of Western Europe. So it's a recent phenomenon. And if you look at the rate of growth in life expectancy since 1950, of the richest 20% of the population, and then the poorest 20% of the population, you can see that if, if the gap, oops, if the gap between the two had remained the same as it was in the 1950s, we'd be somewhere up in the middle again. The fundamental problem has been the slow growth in life expectancy and people at the lower end of the socioeconomic scale. So the first step was to try and understand why that happens. Not to push, produce opinions, but to produce facts. So, it's not smoking. This a uh, study was carried out in European countries about 10, 12 years ago before we introduced a smoking ban. Scottish men were the third lowest smokers in Europe. In a study of about 40 members of the European region of WHO, Scottish teenagers were the fifth lowest smokers in Europe. Scottish women are closer to the European average, but we're not where we are because we're the highest smokers in Europe. Nor is it because of our fatty foods. There's a lot of misinformation about diet and its impact on populations. For example, Finland, you're all familiar with the North Karelia project in which Finland decided this yellow line is Finnish heart disease mortality in men. You can see in the 1960s, Finns had a very high heart disease mortality and you know what they did. They gave subsidies, they moved subsidies around to reduce the consumption of the Finnish population of milk, butter, cream, cheese, etc., thereby making the films the most miserable people in Europe. Um, and then they stood back and they said, look, we've taken all this fat out of the population and see what's happened to the heart disease mortality. Okay? But the green line there is the Scottish heart disease mortality. The Finns radically changed their diet. We did absolutely nothing to change our diet. And we had the same results. Both countries, in fact, all countries, Denmark's in there as well, all countries have experienced significant falls in heart disease for other reasons entirely. Diet isn't our problem. The economic situation is interesting because poverty and inequality of income is often said to be the cause. 
And what we did was we compared inequality in income in three UK cities, Glasgow in Scotland and Liverpool and Manchester in England. This is the distribution of income in Liverpool and this is Glasgow. You can see they're virtually identical, right? And Manchester's the same. And then we looked at the causes of death in the three cities. And this slide shows causes of death in the three cities for seven different groups of problem. The dotted blue line is the standardized mortality rate for Liverpool and Manchester, and these bars are Glasgow. What we found was that people who lived in Glasgow were 30% more likely to die before the age of 65. And 60% of that premature death rate is due to these four causes. Oh. Is due to these four causes of death, which are drugs, alcohol, suicide, and violence. Sixty percent of the excess premature deaths in Scotland: drugs, alcohol, suicide, and violence. These are psychosocial causes of death. We're not going to fix that by reducing the saturated fat content of the diet. Okay, so we began to wonder what's behind this. So we did some more studying because if it's psychosocial causes that have appeared relatively recently, there's a whole different set of policy approaches that we need to put in place. And this slide just looks at one of those causes of death, which is alcoholic liver disease. The line at the top here, this is our 16 Western European countries. The line at the top is the highest death rate any of the 16 Western European countries have reached since 1950. The one at the bottom is the lowest any of them reached, and the one in the middle is the average death rate of our 16 Western European countries. From 1950 to 1970, Scots had just about the lowest death rate from alcoholic liver disease. From 1970 to 1990, stop working. Can we move this? Yep. 1970 to 1990, it went up a bit, but was still below the European average. And, oh, damn. From 1990 to 2005, we became the highest in Western Europe. Since 1990, emergent in the last few decades. And it's come off the top slightly, but the same pattern is obvious in women. Women are still the highest in Western Europe, Scottish women. And if you look at the age range that is particularly affected, the line in the middle is the average level of our 16 Western European countries. This is the death rate in male infants, boys under the age of one. This is boys from, fifth, from one to 15. And you can see there's nothing dramatic about that, close to the European average. But this is young working age men. Since 1990, they've gone 60% above the Western European average. And if you take that working age men line and put older working age men, men from 45 to 65, they're flat, and men over the age of 65 are flat as well. So suddenly this isn't health inequalities, just a sort of bland statement that says the poor are less healthy than the rich. It's actually something that's happening to a very defined sector of the population. Young working age men and women since round about 1980. Okay? So what's going on? If we think about our society before 1980, all the way through the 20th century, West Central Scotland, where most of these problems are concentrated, was one of the busiest industrial centres in Europe. Shipbuilding, steelworks, heavy engineering, it was a huge center of all of these things. About 25 kilometers on either side of the River Clyde, you would see these shipyards. Hundreds of thousands of men who not only had jobs, but they had jobs that gave them pride. They built great ships. And then these jobs began to go away. And if you had skills, you left. And if you didn't have skills, you stayed behind. And usually you didn't work again. And at the same time, housing changed. This is housing in one of the, in one of the poorest areas of Glasgow in the, 19, in the 19th century. And what do you notice when you look at that? You, no, you notice people. 
There are people out socializing, playing, being part of a community. And then we decided to improve the housing. Okay. And communities that were close, communities where people lived together and could help each other out in times of difficulty became disintegrated as folk started to live 20 stories up in the sky. So loss of jobs, loss of community happened in the 70s and 80s. And then we began to see these deaths emerging in younger working age people in the 90s. So we began to think about, well, how, what is it that's missing that should have been creating health? What are the factors that appear in society that create health? And this is a slide I got from two friends in the Nordic School of Public Health, Bent Lindstrom and Monica Eriksson. They've put together about 25 different theories for how health is created. This phrase, this term, salutogenesis. Doctors are obsessed with pathogenesis, the causes of disease, what we're talking about here is the causes of health. And 25 different theories, I have to say I haven't read all of them. But I've read most of them and they all have a common set of, of factors that seem to be acting together. And I'll just mention two of them. The first is Viktor Frankl, whose birthday it is today. I thought you'd want to know that. Um, Viktor Frankl was an Austrian psychotherapist who spent five years in a concentration camp, five years in Auschwitz. And he wrote a book about his experiences there. How was it that he and other men survived those awful circumstances? And what he said was it was due to the fact that they had purpose and meaning in their lives. And what gave them purpose and meaning in those awful circumstances? It was usually family. Men would say to him, I have to survive because my wife would expect me to survive to look after our children. They had hope and a sense of the future and a need to hang on, to cling on to the fact that they would eventually return home. And the introduction to his book, Man's Search for Meaning, he says, if you have a why to live, you can bear with almost any how. Take purpose and meaning away from shipyard workers. They don't have a why to live anymore. Another man from a similar background who wrote a lot about this was an American called Aaron Antonovsky, who looked at concentration camp survivors who'd escaped Israel. And what he found was that 70% of them were unhealthy. They had mental illness, they had physical illness, they had social problems. But the question asked himself was, why aren't they all unhealthy? What was it that allowed the 30% to survive? And he came up with a similar kind of answer he said, the people who remain healthy, who can endure difficulties, who can overcome difficulties and grow in their lives, are people who acquire in early life this thing called sense of coherence. He defined a sense of coherence as the feeling that the world round about us is structured and predictable, the feeling that we have the resilience and the internal capacity to meet the challenges the one throws at us. And finally, we see those challenges as worth engaging with and wanting to overcome. And he said this was all acquired in childhood. Now, he was wrong about that, but he focused very much on childhood. And what he said was that children who, can't, who don't acquire a sense of coherence in early life interpret all the events round about them as noise, not as information. And as a result, if you don't have a sense of coherence, if you don't see the world as comprehensible, manageable, and meaningful, you experience a state of chronic stress. Now, when I read that, I, that made me really excited because I was a surgeon, and my job as a surgeon was to create acute stress in people. Okay, that's what a surgical operation is. The stress response is the body's response to threat a surgical operation allows hormones like cortisol and so on to rush into the bloodstream and that begins the repair process. And what Antonovsky was saying was, unless you had acquired this ability to manage yourself in the world, that stress response would be elevated in the body. 
Now, I don't have time to go into this in great detail, but every single study we've looked at, every single group that we've looked at, the stress response is associated with low levels of socioeconomic position. If you take babies away from their parents, if they become, if they go to orphanages, they get an elevated stress response. The lower down an occupational ladder you are, the more stressed you are because you have no control. The guy at the top has the control. You can't give away work or anything. You have to take it all on. And in countries where the, the population suggests they have little control over their lives, they have high death rates. After the fall of the Berlin Wall, colleague looked at control in countries of the former Soviet bloc. Russians reported the lowest level of control and they had the highest death rates, Poles and Czechs, high levels of control, low death rates. So all of this notion is there and we have shown the way in which this lack of control, this lack of a sense of coherence is associated with a whole range of changes that lead to um, early heart disease and cancer. But the critical thing from today's point of view is that elevated stress in early life is associated with differential growth in certain centers of the brain. Three areas of the brain, this slide comes from New York, from a colleague in New York, Bruce McEwen, who's written a lot about load on individuals. And he's shown, as have others, including ourselves, that three areas of the brain are affected by living with this chronic stress. The first is the prefrontal cortex. This is the bit of the brain that allows you to make sensible decisions. It allows you to take new information in and act on it appropriately. It's the bit of the brain that sees the world as structured and predictable. It doesn't grow such dense cell connections in young animals and in young humans who are stressed. The other bit of the brain, the hippocampus, is the bit of the brain that's important for learning you need the hippocampus to be functioning to integrate short and long-term memory. It gets smaller the lower down the social scale you are. So learnings are compromised in children who experience chaos and difficulty in early life. But the critical thing about the hippocampus is the bit of the brain that gets most cortisol receptors. These receptors detect how much cortisol there is in the bloodstream, and when it gets above a certain level, they switch off production of cortisol by the adrenal glands. Colleagues in North America have shown that where there is chaotic early life, the brain has far fewer of these cortisol receptors active. And the other bit of the brain that's important is the amygdala. This is the bit of the brain that lights up when you're emotionally aroused. And this gets more active in children who have experienced chaos. So they're more likely to be fearful, anxious, aggressive, uncertain. So you combine that with the fact that they're poorer learners and they're less able to suppress inappropriate behavior in new social situations. It's inevitable that children that come from difficult circumstances do less well at school. This is, we've, we've studied affluent and deprived Scots, a magnetic resonance image of the bit of the brain in which we measure hippocampal volume, we do serial sections. We also use fancy things to measure the, the integrity of the cells. The lower down the social scale you go, the less well able people are to use that. And we've measured that in terms of psychometric testing. This is a test of prefrontal cortex activity. You have a computer, you flash up new information, and it measures the time it takes you to hit the correct button in response to that new information. What this slide shows is that the most deprived Scots in these light-colored bars take about 150 milliseconds longer to get the right answer. And what that means, it doesn't sound very much 150 milliseconds, but if two cars are driving side by side at, say, 70, 80 kilometers an hour, one driven by a rich guy, one driven by someone down the social scale, and a child walks out in front of them, the car being driven by the man at the bottom of the socioeconomic ladder will take one to two car lengths longer to stop because he takes that length of time to integrate the new inter information into his brain. 
So there's a whole number of ways in which people at the bottom of the social scale are consistently disadvantaged. Okay. This is the molecular biology of a hug, okay? I'm showing you this to show you just how clever I am, how much I know. <laughs> what happens when a baby's hugged, or what happens when I'm hugged, come to that? Well, it depends on who's hugging me, I suppose. But what happens when you hug someone? They, they become happy, assuming it's the right person. And happiness is associated with the release of a chemical, 5-hydroxytryptamine or serotonin in the brain, it circulates in the bloodstream. It gets picked up by a transport mechanism on the cell wall, which takes it into the nucleus of the cell. Chromosome number five has a locus on it, which when it binds to 5-HT, activates the gene, and that produces the cortisol receptor. If you fail to hug children, if children are not nurtured, it doesn't allow them to develop the capacities to suppress the stress response. And certainly in Britain, there's a, there's a rule that teachers must never hug or touch children. If they fall in the playground, they're not supposed to be comforted. And it's just crazy. It's not the right way to do things. We know in minute detail the biology of all of this. So what do we do about it? Because it calls for action. And this is the destabilization. I go to our ministers and I say, well, you know, your policies will change the way babies' brains develop. <laughs> really? It's not an opinion, it's a fact. So let's try and see how we can get the right policies. And it's not just affluent and deprived Scots or Europeans. This study comes from, from California, middle class Californians, 17,000 of them followed up over uh, many years. What they did was they looked at the, the relationship between nine different types of abuse and Outcome. Children who experience four or more adverse events in early life are eight times more likely to become alcoholics, four times more likely to become heroin abusers than children who experience none of them. Boys who experience physical violence at the hands of an older male are eight times more likely to indulge in partner violence, domestic violence when they grow up, four times more likely to be arrested for carrying weapons. Drugs, alcohol, suicide, and violence. So our hypothesis is that what we've seen with the disintegration of society in West Central Scotland 30, 40 years ago has led to a generation that have experienced chaotic early life, and they in turn are passing that on to their children and so on. And this is exactly what you would predict in societies that begin to disintegrate. Southern Europe, what's happening in Greece just now, they will experience the same thing for generations to come. There's no question about that. So we create wellness through this idea that we can manage stress, that whenever we're overcome by events, we, get, we engage with them, we, we feel that we can manage it, and we resolve the stress, and that builds up our sense of well-being. But in addition, we need external resources that allow us to cope when things get really tough. And that might be family, it might be having a job, it might be success at school and in education. It's maybe a cultural thing. We've been speaking to public health doctors in Australia and North America where native cultures have been dislocated and they see exactly the same thing. You lose your cultural identity, you lose those anchors, then what happens is that the sense of coherence becomes damaged. That cycle of chaotic early years, inequality in other areas of life, like um, occupation and education, leads to poverty, and the cycle just runs and it erodes this sense of coherence. This is one of the most disturbing slides I think I ever show. It shows the impact of chaotic homes on cognitive performance of children. Children aged two who score on the 90th centile or the 10th centile were followed up until they were 10. Children from high socioeconomic status families more or less preserved their cognitive function, 
whereas children from low socioeconomic status, their cognitive function was eroded. And children on the 10th centile who were from low socioeconomic status families, they stayed low, whereas children from high socioeconomic status who started off on the 10th centile almost became as good as the clever ones at age two. Social circumstances have far more to do with educational outcome than genetics. The way in which we structure society erodes the ability of children to perform. They become alienated and they are sent thereafter in a life of alienation. So what are we doing about it? I did all this stuff and then I went to ministers and said, you have to do something about this. So they said, okay, what? So what we said was, well, let's craft a solution. Don't let's do it the usual way. Let's define an aim and work out with the whole system how we're going to achieve that aim. And the typical approach by which any government does things is this. They get experts in a room, okay? And the experts talk, and somebody takes minutes, and they talk again, and somebody takes minutes, and they talk again, and somebody takes minutes. And then eventually they prepare a report which goes to the minister who says, okay, and then a civil servant writes a, a strategic plan and it goes out and maybe something happens, but usually not very much happens, okay? And why is that? Because the people who have to deliver it haven't been involved in designing it. And we decided that whatever we delivered, the whole system was going to be involved in designing it. And we decided to start off by changing childhood. So what we do is we got everyone together, we got 800 people from all 32 counties together, and we got them to design what they were going to do, and then we got them to go out into the real world and test it, and collect data. And if it worked, we got them to do more about it. If it still worked, we got them to tell everybody. And if it didn't work, we told them to stop it. And gradually we began to see what worked. So by the time it needs to be approved, it's already happening. What you mean the minister said, okay, I'm very good, I've been doing this for two years. That's how it happens. That's our early years collaborative. 800 people get together every four months. This is the permanent secretary, the head civil servant of the Scottish government. He comes to every meeting. Our finance minister came to do a 20 minute speech and he stayed for five hours. And he left saying it was the most exciting piece of public sector reform he had ever seen. And this is an example of what it's done. We, we, we've done this in patient safety. The Scottish patient safety is now the Danish patient safety program, all right, because you came and stole it from us, but that's fine because we always steal things from you as well. And this, for, this is an example of how we eradicated some infections in an intensive care unit. Ventilator-acquired pneumonia, people who have a ventilator breathing for them will almost always get a pneumonia if it's happening for long enough. So we found some evidence-based interventions that would work, and we said to the doctors, apply these, and they say, no, these will never work. We said, yeah, trust us, they'll work. It's been tried elsewhere. Okay, but we already do it. We said, oh, really? Prove it. Uh, well, we can't prove it, of course. Well, just go and do it and collect the data that shows you've done it. And you see here, this is one intensive care unit, and this is... They weren't doing any of it here, and gradually they started to do it. And by the time they got up to 100% compliance with the, the interventions, they were having no, no ventilator-acquired pneumonias. There are now hospitals in Scotland that have gone more than 600 days without a single ventilator-acquired pneumonia. And if you look at how that's translated into mortality in Scottish hospitals, Mortality in the years leading up to the introduction of these changes was falling at this rate. Since we introduced it, it's, the rate of decline has tripled. In the last four years, we have seen 10,000 fewer than predicted deaths in Scottish hospitals because we've done a lot of things that have made a little difference and it's all added up to a big difference. The front line has done that, not the government, the people at the front line. So our early years collaborative, our ambition is to make Scotland the best place in the world to grow up. And we write down aims. And the aims we started with, we've extended it. 
The aims are, first of all, to reduce infant mortality. The only countries that will have a lower infant mortality than us by the time we're finished, this will be Sweden and Iceland. Infant mortality, and make sure that children reach their developmental milestones, and 90% of them will have reached their developmental milestones by the time they go to school. So you set yourself an aim, and then you get people together to discuss how they're going to achieve that aim. And this is an example of how you do it. You draw a, di a driver diagram. This is one of our aims. These are the primary drivers, a set of societal issues, a set of emotional and intellectual development things that we need to do and things that we need to do to support the carers. And the system then says, okay, we can think of 10 things that we can do that will help one of these. So they go out and try it and they collect data. We don't ask them to do things for three years and then get a university department to come and evaluate it because they'll always say it didn't work. What we do is we get them on a day-to-day -day basis to measure things. For example, bedtime reading. They said, right, we want 90% of all children in Scotland to get a story at bedtime. So this is one, this is a nursery school quite close to my office. They collect, on, every day they ask the children, did you get a bedtime story? And the aim is to get 90% of them. So they look at the things that influence it, and then they come back every three months, and they tell people, well, what we've done about bedtime stories is this. And other nurseries will take it up. And here's a nursery that's achieving its 90% target, more or less. The things it has done to reach those outcomes. And they're doing hundreds of things that will all contribute to those outcomes. And they're stopping doing things that aren't working. And they're all agreeing on the 10 or 12 or 15 things that really make a difference. It's been going for just over a year, and we're already beginning to see that happen. So, we decided, having seen the Early Years Collaborative start with making Scotland the best place in the world to grow up, we should move on and look through the life course at other places we could make a difference. Young people in prison who've taken drink or drugs and got involved in fights, how do we stop them reoffending? And the target there is to start closing prisons. I said to our, our finance minister, found us 500 million pounds a couple of years ago to help this happen. And I said to him, and he said to me, will it eventually save us money? And I said, yeah, it'll save us money, but it'll take 40 years, and by then you will have closed prisons. And he said, that's exactly what we should do. So much for politicians just being interested in the short term. We have wonderful politicians in Scotland. For the older people, this originally was going to be called Make 60 the New 40, and I thought that wasn't nearly ambitious enough. So we're going to change care for, we're going to change lives for older people by making sure that they're connected to each other and that they're physically active and reduce dependency and keep them alert and so on. And we've just started something for teenagers now. So what we have been doing is essentially trying to Take the families and the young children who have become alienated, who have drifted off the mainstream because of their social conditions, and bring them in together into society again. And I first heard that idea being floated by this man in 1971. He was a trade union leader in Glasgow, and when the government in London wanted to close shipbuilding in the Clyde, he stopped them. And he didn't stop them by taking the workers out on strike. He stopped them by taking the workers into work. They occupied the shipyards, they locked the gates, and they kept on building ships. And eventually the government backed down. And Scottish universities, the old Scottish universities, Glasgow University is 560 years old, have a, the students elect the head of the university. And we elected Jimmy Reid. I was a medical student in 1971 when we elected Jimmy Reid Lord Rector of Glasgow University. His speech, his rectorial speech, was reprinted in full in the New York Times, which called it the single most important public speech the world has heard since the Gettysburg Address. And those of us who were there thought that was very flattering to Abraham Lincoln. The speech was about alienation. The first time I'd heard this, 
and he defined it as the cry of men who feel themselves the victims of blind economic forces beyond their control, the frustration of ordinary people excluded from the processes of decision making, the feeling of despair and hopelessness that pervades people who feel with justification they have no say in shaping or determining their own destinies. That's the problem. All I've done since then is describe the biological consequences of that and the whole approach of our collaborative improvement science approach has been designed to reverse alienation, to bring people who might become alienated back into society, but do it systematically at scale and count what we're doing so we know we've done it. Another guy who came to Glasgow recently was this man here, who's a priest in South Los Angeles, and 30 years ago he was sent to a parish and he was told he would be lucky to be alive at the end of a week. He would be killed. 30 years on, he started a business to employ all these Latino gang members. They started, they started with a bakery. He then had to start a tattoo removal service because all the guys he employed in his bakeries had gang tattoos and they started fighting with each other. So he, he got a plastic surgeon to teach two of the gang members how to remove tattoos. He now, when he came to Glasgow to tell us about violence reduction, he brought with him an ex-head of Los Angeles Police Department who said, Father Boyle showed us we couldn't arrest our way out of trouble. And he also brought with us the chief executive of his business who did 25 years in jail, 16 of them in death row. Now the chief executive of this business. And one of the things he said at that meeting really struck home to me. What we need across society is a compassion that looks at awe at the burdens the poor have to carry rather than stands in judgment at the way they carry them. That needs to be our starting point. We mustn't judge people in difficulty because if we were in the same difficulties they were, would we be any different? What we must do is help them steer their way out of difficulty. Give them the support they need to do things for themselves that get them out of difficulty. Not do things to them, but do things with them is the way in which you will reverse the alienation, encourage inclusion, and reverse a lot of these biological things that we've been talking about. What we say to our people in Scotland is, don't wait to be told. If you have a good idea of something that might work, even although it's not well thought through, try it. And if it works, do more of it. And if it still works, tell everybody it works. And we've created this climate, particularly with early years, that leads people to be brave. Don't wait for the government to tell you what to do. You do it and you come and tell the government, but do it with people, not to people. So my final words to you would be this. Do something brave and don't forget to hug. <laughs> Thanks very much. Yeah. I'll take questions there if you want. Yeah. Thank you very much. I think we have the time for one or two questions. Raise your hand. Yep. Yeah. Are there any that are tighter on? Here we are. Du kan, der er 12, du kan overhovedet godt dansk. Well, thank you very much for such an interesting talk and lecture. My question is that the uh, mission you accomplished, it must have cost you a lot of money. <laughs> how, did you, how did you fund it? No, the money is already out there. What we, what we have done is we've asked people to work differently. Instead of social workers who do things to people, we've said, hey, wait a minute, change the relationship. Work with people. I, I mean, I, I, go, I do a lot of this myself. I go in and meet three or four people who are very worried about a community. 
more drugs coming in, money getting short and so on, and maybe social workers, maybe a, a local community policeman, maybe a teacher, and you say to them, what would you like this community to be like? What do you think the future for this community is? And this, they're shocked because no one from government ever asks them a question like that. But you give them permission to think and they start talking and they start getting excited about possibilities. And then I go away. And I'll go back two or three months later and there's 60 or 70 people in the hall. The community has mobilized. And the community starts to do things. Money appears. The local business starts to donate things. Where children have had no place to play, suddenly grounds are opened up and football pitches appear and so on because local volunteers go and make them. And the money is all already out there. You maybe need a small amount of money. There are some very specialized services. Teenagers who get pregnant, for example, we give them the Family Nurse Partnership. I don't know if you've heard of that, but Family Nurse Partnership is relatively expensive because they have a one, they have a nurse allocated to them as soon as they become pregnant. If they want it, we don't force it on them. And she helps them through the pregnancy in the first year. That's, that's quite expensive. We have to find some money for that. But by and large, communities, once they become mobilized, take care of a lot of the problems. A community will say, oh, things are very violent, and the police can't do anything to stop it. And then they go through this process, and six months later, they're telling me, you know, once we got going, we realized there were only three families causing all the problems, and we'll fix that. So don't let the thought, oh, this is going to cost us a lot of money, stop you. Just do it, as Nike would say. The other thing is that this will save money in the long term. A child who has to be taken into care, on average, we've calculated, will cost society two million pounds between then and its 25th birthday. Now, I, what I say is we're not doing this to save money, we're doing it because it's the right thing to do. This is about justice, and we are pursuing a just society. So don't let the money the money will come, don't worry. Politicians love to jump on winners, all right? They love to back a winning cause. Thank you very much for a very, very, very inspirational speech. I just want to quote uh, a motto for a Nordic forum, a Nordic uh, gathering of women's organizations this summer, the following summer, and the motto is, don't agonize. Organize. Yeah. Yep. I can, I can um, sympathize with that. Can we have a sister spasmol? It's late. It is. <laughs> I can smell the beer. <laughs> <laughs> So, Harry Burns, once again, thank you very much for giving us such a good introduction to the good life and the complexity in how to deal with the differences in, in, in well-behave. Thank you very much. Til alle sammen, pause nu. Husk bestyrelse, det nye bestyrelse. Bestyrelsesmøde, konstituerende møde om 12 minutter. Et eller andet sted, som jeg ikke kan huske, hvor jeg er henne. Resten, velkomstring kl. 19.00.